When Alaska was purchased from Russia by the United States, it was supposedly widely opposed by the American people. The press gave Alaska mock names such as Wall Russia, the Polar Bear Gardens, and most famously, Seward's Folly. This term has since then been part of every book on US history to describe a feeling of discontent that the government had spent millions of dollars on a large swath of nothingness. It was too far north, it wasn't worth a dime, and that money was better spent on rebuilding the nation after the Civil War. But this is actually one of the strongest historical myths in American history. In fact, a majority of US citizens was in favor of the purchase. They saw the huge potential for extracting natural resources and the purchase has paid out handsomely. So what were the events surrounding the purchase of Alaska? Why is it remembered incorrectly? And why does this myth continue to persist? This is the real reason why the US bought Alaska with hindsight. Alaska is one of the richest US states, thanks in part due to its abundance of natural resources. The exploitation of whale oil, fur, gold, fish and petroleum have over the years accumulated to hundreds of billions of dollars in profit. This has allowed Alaska to completely erase state sales tax and income tax. Not only do Alaskan residents not pay these taxes, they receive an actual stipend of around 1,600 US dollars per year. This is paid from the Alaska Permanent Fund. This fund was created shortly after the oil from Alaska's North Slope began flowing through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. This was expected to be coupled with a major payday. And instead of investing this into real estate or cities in the form of a line, they invested 25% of all revenue in a public fund. That fund is now worth $64 billion. It allows Alaskans to receive money every year to pay virtually no taxes. And on top of that, they have a median household income of just over $73,000, $18,000 over the national average. Alaska makes the United States an Arctic power. It was of key strategic importance during World War II and it's expected to still contain hundreds of billions of barrels of oil. All in all, I think that very few Americans right now regret the purchase. Now, take a look at this map. This was our knowledge of the world in 1699. As you can see, the entire region north of California and west of central Canada is what is called white space. Russia became the first European power to explore this region. In the mid 1500s, they were pursuing an expansionist policy. It started in 1581 when they overran the Khanate of Sevier, which was controlled by a grandson of Genghis Khan. This kicked off the Russian conquest of Siberia. Their expansion to the east was fueled by the lucrative fur trade, a desire to expand the Russian Orthodox faith and the addition of new taxpayers to the empire. They were incredibly successful and in less than a hundred years, they had reached the Pacific. They founded the city of Okhotsk, which quickly turned into the main Russian base on the Pacific coast. And in the years that followed, they acquired new territory to the south and they acquired the Kamchatka Peninsula. The Russian settlers in Okhotsk would travel overland to the Kamchatka Peninsula to acquire expansive fur pelts. These were then transported from Okhotsk through a complex network of rivers to Western Russia, where they were worn by aristocrats and they were sold to European markets. The Russian settlers were skilled builders of riverboats, but they lacked the knowledge of building seagoing vessels. This meant that they had to travel overland to Kamchatka instead of taking the much shorter route over water. But that would soon change. It's the early 1700s. The Tsar of Russia was Peter the Great. He had established the Russian Navy just a few years earlier, and now he focused his attention on the Far East. 
He chose the city of Okhotsk as his main staging point for his eastern explorations. He selected a Danish explorer, Vitus Bering, as the captain of the first Kamchatka expedition. This expedition started in the city of Okhotsk in 1724. They left the port and sailed around Kamchatka. From this moment, they had no way of communicating with the outside world. And they were completely on their own. They were the first Europeans to sight Alaska. And they confirmed the existence of a strait, which would later be named after Captain Bering. They spent nearly three years at sea and made cartographic assessments of eastern Siberia, which up to that point appeared as white space on every single map. In 1729, they returned, and the first Russian naval expedition was a fact. The Tsar was jubilant about the discoveries of Bering, and he ordered preparations to be made for a second, much larger expedition. This became a matter of national importance. One of the main objectives was to find a northeast passage, for goods in eastern Russia at that time to reach the markets in Europe, the only possible route was through inland Siberia or along the American or the African continents. The discovery of a northeast passage would drastically shorten this trip. The second expedition had the strength of 3,000 people and the Tsar allocated one-sixth of that year's entire national income to the expedition. This was one of the largest exploration projects in history. In 1733, it started. They were the first Europeans to sail along the Aleutian Islands and Alaska. Over the course of eight years, they made detailed cartographic assessments, the first of their kind in human history. They spent year after year on the water without being able to communicate with St. Petersburg until in 1741, the ship got into rough weather. They shipwrecked on Bering Island, and the winter was about to set in. The crew was forced to spend the cold winter months on the island, and many died of scurvy. Captain Bering, together with 27 other crew members, didn't survive. The remaining 46 survivors built a small boat from the wreckage, measuring only 12 meters. They filled it up to the brink with sea otter pelts, and they sailed to a Russian settlement in Kamchatka. Here they were welcomed by their Russian comrades. The news of their arrival made headlines around the world. The geography department of the St. Petersburg Academy of Science later published this map. It features the route of the expedition, as well as a detailed map of this area that was never seen before. The major powers in Europe were paying close attention. A British cartographer later published this map, entitled The Russian Discoveries. The sea otter pelts that the crew had brought with them was later judged to be the finest fur in the world, and the crew told stories about how the Aleutian Islands and Alaska were teeming with them. This resulted in a gold rush. Russian settlers flocked to the new territories in search of quick riches. The state set up the Russian American Company. They built a permanent settlement on what is now the Alaskan Panhandle, and the company was granted a monopoly on trade in the region. The territory was called Russian America. When the Russians arrived, this territory was home to roughly 100,000 native peoples that lived in tribes scattered across the peninsula, around 17,000 of whom inhabited the Aleutian Islands. When the Russian settlement got into high gear, the Empress of Russia was Catherine the Great. She passed a law that declared all natives in Russian America to be subjects of Russia, and they could therefore be forced into labor for the Russian American company. Russia ruled the natives with an iron fist. They took the children of the natives' leaders hostage, and they frequently resorted to extreme force. This led to the indigenous community to plummet to only 50,000 by the mid-1800s. On the Aleutian Islands, more than 90% were exterminated. The Russian settlers numbered no more than 800 at its peak, and life for them was tough. Russian America was too far north to sustain significant agriculture, 
and its sheer distance from St. Petersburg made communication extremely challenging. Russian settlers were looking for partners to trade for food that wouldn't grow in the harsh climate of Russian America. In 1812, they sent ships to what is now California, and they established a settlement just north of San Francisco Bay. It was called Fort Ross, and it became the first multi-ethnic community in California, with a combination of native Californians, native Alaskans, and Russian settlers. They traded mostly with the Spanish settlers, who had trade posts in Central and Southern California. The United States was still in the early days of its expansion. They had purchased Louisiana a few years earlier, and they were jointly administering Oregon County with Great Britain. The Brits in the early 1820s expanded its territories to include much of North America. These territories were established as a commercial monopoly for the Hudson's Bay Company, which was headquarters in York Factory. This company controlled much of the fur trade in British North America, and they functioned as the de facto government over much of this territory. It's 1822. A US commercial ship was near Russian America to trade fur with the natives when it was seized by the Russians. The United States protested and the ship was released. Russia and the United States were close allies in that time. And this encounter led to the first treaty between the two powers. They agreed upon this line to be the boundary of Russia's claims in America and this essentially meant that the US recognized Russia's claim to Alaska. The Russian fur trade was thriving for decades, but due to overhunting, the populations of the sea otters, beavers, foxes and seals was now critically low. It reached a point that the business was no longer profitable, and the 1840s and 50s marked a turning point. On the other side of the vast Russian Empire, a war was waging. Russia had been embattled in the costly Crimean War for several years, in which they aimed to gain access to the warm water ports of the Black Sea. They were fighting, amongst others, against the Ottoman Empire, France and Great Britain. This was burdensome on the Russian state. Meanwhile, they had just purchased new territory from China which gave them better access to the Pacific Ocean and to the markets of East Asia. In the theater of the Crimean War, the British Navy had attacked Russian settlements in Kamchatka. This was aimed at preventing a Russian attack on British and French trade in the region, and it demonstrated the complexity for Russia to defend its easternmost territories. Russian America was no longer profitable, and it became a liability for Russian defense especially since the arch enemy at that time, Great Britain, was expanding towards its eastern borders. In 1856, at the highest level of Russian government, the topic was already raised to sell the colony, and it had to be sold to the United States. An additional benefit of selling to the Americans was that they both shared a hostile relationship with Great Britain. If the territory was absorbed into the United States, it would serve as a buffer between Russia and Great Britain. William Seward, at that time governor of New York, said that it was the American destiny to settle the Pacific coast and he was an outspoken proponent of purchasing Russian America. The Americans foresaw the potential for gold, fur and fisheries, as well as an improved position for trade with Japan and China. The United States had already begun commercial whaling in the waters around Russian America. The acquisition would pave the way for acquiring British Columbia and for becoming a Pacific power. In 1859, Russia made an official offer to the United States, but the timing wasn't right. The United States was facing increasingly challenging domestic issues. Two years later, the American Civil War started. Abraham Lincoln was elected president that same year, and he appointed William H. Seward as his Secretary of State. Russia was the only European power that supported the Union in the American Civil War. When four years later, the war was won by the Unionists, Russia had the diplomatic connections to make another offer. Eduard de Stuckel was a Russian diplomat in Washington. He was popular amongst his American colleagues, 
He was married to an American and he had 15 years of experience in Washington. He received permission from Tsar Alexander II to negotiate selling Russian America. He was hoping that a successful negotiation would bring him financial reward and a better position in Europe. On this painting, he can be seen standing next to a globe pointing at Alaska. On the chair next to him sits William H. Stewart, who was appointed to negotiate on behalf of the United States. In March 1867, they met at the Russian legation, the official residence of the Russian ambassador. In this building, Stuckel made his offer official. Seward asked for a meeting with President Andrew Johnson and he shared the news. President Johnson said to be not inclined towards the purchase, but that he was willing to accept Seward's judgment. This was something that Seward had been wanting for nearly two decades. And now was the time that he finally had the opportunity to make it a reality. He returned to the Russian embassy to start the negotiation. Stuckel was authorized by the Tsar to sell Russian America for any price above $5 million, but he kept that quietly to himself. Seward told the ambassador that he would lobby for support for the acquisition, but he warned Stuckel that he probably would not be able to pay anything over $5 million, or five and a half tops. Stuckel was jubilant, but he kept quiet. The following day, Seward presented a draft treating in a cabinet meeting, asking for the authority to pay $7 million. There was very little interest. President Johnson made no comments, but nobody disagreed. Seward returned to the embassy that afternoon, and after a short negotiation, they agreed to the price of $7.2 million. The treaty was approved. President Johnson placed his signature and it was ratified by Tsar Alexander from Russia. Stuckel got his royal payout and he was transferred to Paris. Russian America was now ceded to the United States along with most of its possessions. All Russians were ordered to return to Russia within three years or to become American citizens. The territory was renamed Alaska after the Aleut word for the mainland. At this moment, the United States gained about 425 million acres of mostly pristine wilderness, almost a third the size of the European Union. It ended Russia's 125-year-long rule, and it started a new chapter under the American flag. The territory was sold at only two cents per acre, which is an incredibly low price. So where does the idea of sewage folly come from? The previous expansion of the United States was characterized by pioneers moving into nearby empty territory. It was a widely felt cultural belief that Americans were destined to expand across North America. This is called Manifest Destiny. The purchase of Alaska, however, interrupted this pattern. Its geographic location made it much tougher for American pioneers to settle. In the direct aftermath of the sale, there were accusations of newspapers and congressmen that were bribed to take a favorable stance on the purchase. It was a widely felt belief that the purchase was motivated by individuals trying to enrich themselves. But the negative public opinion about the purchase has been gravely exaggerated. In this landmark study from 1958, the author studied articles from 48 influential newspapers and he concluded the initial response of certain newspapers was far from universally opposed to the purchase of Alaska. The initial reporting also called it a bargain, a wonderland, and it underscored its strategic importance for trade and defense. The stories soon broke about the enormous riches, how it strengthens economic ties with East Asia, how it could lead to the acquisition of British Columbia and how it strengthened ties with Russia. But somehow the idea of Seward's folly stuck. The idea that the purchase was collectively ridiculed by a majority of the population. While in reality, a majority of Americans had a favorable opinion about the purchase. The only people that collectively condemned the transfer were native Alaskans. They had occupied these territories for centuries 
In a testimony to Congress, they argued that they only allowed Russians to occupy it for their mutual benefit. The fact that the sale happened without their knowledge and that the proceeds from the sale went to Russians was collectively condemned. At the time of the purchase, Alaska was inhabited by only 2,000 whites and 25,000 natives, a quarter of the population before Russian arrival. When Seward visited Alaska a few years later, he ordered a constant display of military force. Whites should always be vigilant, always be ready to shoot. The policy that was advised was to hold an entire tribe responsible for the crime of an individual. The Bureau of Indian Affairs began a campaign to eradicate indigenous languages, religion, art, music, dance, ceremonies, and lifestyles. The United States constituted a civil government in 1884, seeking a way to impose U.S. mining laws. A few years later, major gold deposits were discovered in Yukon, sparking the Klondike Gold Rush. Tens of thousands of prospectors rushed north in search of finding their fortune. Shortly thereafter, gold was also found near Nome and Fairbanks, growing both settlements into major towns. This was the beginning of the immensely profitable mining industry in Alaska. In northern Alaska, the world's largest reserves of zinc were later discovered. The Red Dog Mine accounts for 10% of the world's zinc production and accounts for over half of the Alaskan mineral value. But as Alaska was enriching itself, they also made tremendous improvements to the rights of native populations. In 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act was passed, granting Alaska natives the right to vote, own property, and to file mining claims. In 1946, the Indian Reorganization Act authorized natives to form their own governments. In 1945, the Anti-Discrimination Act of Alaska outlawed discrimination. And in 1959, upon receiving statehood, the federal government allotted roughly a quarter of the land to native tribes. Of the 740,000 people that inhabit Alaska today, 120,000 are natives. It is without a doubt that the purchase of Alaska has paid off handsomely. But despite the countless efforts of historians to prove that it was indeed a popular decision at the time, the idea of Seward's folly is still widely taught in history classes around the country. Some have argued that this is in part due to American and Alaskan writers who prefer to view the territory as distinct, exceptional, and filled with self-reliant pioneers. But shattering this myth could help us better understand the subsequent spread of the US empire to Puerto Rico, Hawaii, American Samoa, the Philippines, and other parts of the Pacific. This video here on the left is my assessment of the South China Sea dispute. Consider it for your next watch.